O guardians of the watchtower of the east, I, Ishtar, high priestess and witch, do summon and stir thee. I command thy presence at this, our meeting, to guard over our circle and to witness our rites. Witchcraft is the fastest growing offshoot of paganism and neo-paganism today. Hundreds of thousands of children and teenagers are joining its ranks according to reports from an ever-increasing number of pagan websites. The Pagan Federation of England claims their mailbags swell by the thousands from charmed teenagers every time a particularly exciting episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer airs on TV or an enticing article on witchcraft appears in a popular teen magazine. Witchcraft, or Wicca as it is known, believes in revering the mother goddess, the global environment, feminist practices, and nature. The holy read or rule, do what you want as long as it harms no one, is Wicca's most appealing draw, encouraging its adherents to indulge in self-gratification and self-centeredness, while allowing morals to shift at will. Wicca teaches there is no absolute truth or sin and replaces the patriarchal male creator God of the Bible with a belief in both male and female gods. Most pagans and witches believe they must communicate with supernatural spirits, which they refer to as forces of nature, in order to receive wisdom and power for magical skills. They also embrace the concept of self-empowerment by awakening internal spirituality through meditation, visualization, and other mind-altering techniques of self-hypnosis. Dimly lit parlors or new age fairs are no longer the only places to practice secret magic, fortune telling, spell casting, or potion mixing. As a result of aggressive marketing campaigns, a wide variety of witchcraft techniques offering powers of control for personal achievements can now be found at bookstores, on the internet, in public schools and libraries, and throughout the media. Hollywood's presentation of witchcraft as exciting and glamorous has further increased its appeal to young audiences. Enhanced by digital technology and revolutionary special effects, occultic spells and rituals are given visually stunning portrayals, as are the depictions of supernatural beings, ghosts, demons, vampires, mythological characters, and even Satan. A growing number of cartoons and television dramas aimed at increasingly younger audiences further seduce children with the allure of sorcery and divination. Occultic themes are frequently woven into the storylines of primetime series, which has undoubtedly contributed to the practice of magic as being the fastest growing mystical attraction among teenagers. The spectacular growth of the internet which occultists refer to as the portal of transcendence, has further fanned the fascination of spiritual alternatives. An unprecedented amount of occult literature is available online. At Amazon.com, for example, consumers can find more than 1,850 books on witchcraft. And in addition, hundreds of websites are dedicated to marketing witchcraft specifically to children. Pagans and witches worldwide can now communicate and perform ritual magic online through an ever-expanding number of highly networked, occult-oriented chat rooms. Countless websites now offer everything from poison rings to spells for young people seeking empowerment. Each year, thousands of teens are turning their backs on Christianity and joining witches' covens in order to learn spells so as to pass school exams, attract boyfriends or girlfriends, and get rich. The secretary of the Magic Circle's Young Magicians Club credits the Harry Potter books as the latest rage, which he says has rekindled the childlike approach to the fact that the impossible may be possible. He gives thanks to Harry, who he says has sparked an interest in pure magic, real magic, strong magic. Harry Potter, the orphan child wizard, already famous in his own magical world because he survived the murderous black magic death curse of the evil Lord Voldemort, has now duplicated his fame in the real world. Under the category of children's fantasy literature, sales of Harry Potter books have received phenomenal acceptance worldwide, breaking all records in children's literature with over 100 million books sold in 200 countries. 
Harry Potter has been translated into more than 40 languages. A massive global marketing campaign partnered by Warner Brothers, Mattel, and Coca-Cola guarantees that the Harry Potter image will be kept before the public for years to come through films, toys, video games, and every type of merchandising product imaginable. According to a U.S. consumer research survey, over half of all children between the ages of 6 and 17 have read at least one Harry Potter book, with thousands reporting multiple readings of all of the books. These volumes range anywhere from 309 to 734 pages, while many parents are thrilled by the prospect of their children taking an interest in reading, other parents and educators view Harry Potter as the latest tool being used to disciple children into the darkest aspects of black magic. Through Harry Potter books and audios, children as young as kindergarten age are being introduced to human sacrifice, the sucking of blood from dead animals, and possession by spirit beings. Set in England, the Harry Potter story begins on Halloween night, with the murder of Harry's parents by the evil Lord Voldemort. Through the sacrificial goddess magic of his mother's love, baby Harry is saved, and his blood is given magical powers. Unable to kill Harry in revenge, Voldemort sears a death curse of a lightning bolt on Harry's forehead. In the real world, thousands of young fans demonstrate their allegiance to Harry by taking the mark of the lightning bolt on their own foreheads. Dear Mr. Potter, you have been accepted to Hogwarts School of witchcraft and wizardry. Harry is magically selected to attend the 1,000-year-old Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Both Voldemort and Harry's parents attended the prestigious boarding school before him. All of Hogwarts teachers are practicing occultists and instruct their students in the proper use of magic tools, spells, and rituals. Headmaster Albus Dumbledore owns a phoenix the powerful mythological bird, the symbol of resurrection. The magical wands of both Harry and Voldemort share the same power, which is a tail feather from Dumbledore's phoenix. Therefore, in the world of Harry Potter, the power source of Harry's so-called good magic and Voldemort's evil magic is one and the same. The question is, should parents be concerned that the alluring power behind witchcraft is being made to look innocent and is being targeted towards their children through the Harry Potter phenomenon. I read the first one eight times, the second one three times, and the fourth one, I mean, and the third one four times. So does the hubbub over Harry Potter seem outlandish, or do parents have a real argument here? Well, joining us now from Columbia, South Carolina, is Steve Mounts. He is a parent who has expressed concerns about the book's use at schools. Also joining us is Jennifer James from Watertown, Massachusetts. She is a children's book buyer for Wordsworth Books. All right, Mr. Mounts, let me start with you. These are number one books on the bestsellers list, winner of the National Book Award in the UK. Kids love them. So what do you find particularly objectionable about these books? The thing that we found, my wife and I found objectionable, was it was being read aloud to our son in his class. And uh, there were things that we believe had a religious connotation to them, witchcraft, Wicca. Uh, which the Supreme Court has now said is a religion. The IRS has given it religious status. Uh, the military's got Wicca chaplains. 
And we just wanted an opportunity to find out, is this religion being taught in our son's class? Now, you went before the South Carolina Board of Education earlier this week. Uh, what are you asking the board to do? We asked them to review the book for religious content, for violence. Uh, in this post-Columbine era that we're living in, uh, we felt like uh, with kids living out their fantasies, uh, this book may have potential for that. Jennifer James, let me go to you now. What do you like about the Harry Potter books? What value do they have, do you think? I think they're some of the greatest books written for children. They're full of adventure and fantasy, and every kid loves them. All right, well, let's take a look at a couple of passages from the book here. The, this is from book one. See what I have become, the face said. Mere shadow and vapor. I have form only when I can share another's body. But there have always been those willing to let me into their hearts and minds. Unicorn blood has strengthened me these past weeks. Yikes, unicorn blood? Uh, Jennifer, you hear that and you think, well, maybe uh, Mr. Mounts has a point here. I think it's just fantasy. It's, it's a book. It's not reality. And I think children can make the difference. They can draw the line. Well, Steve, that's a good point. Don't you think that uh, fourth and fifth graders are smart enough to be able to distinguish? Don't you think your son knows the difference between fantasy and reality? He'd probably have a hard time finding a unicorn in South Carolina, but <laughs> uh, most of the time when we have uh, police reports of the occult or witchcraft, it always involves an animal sacrifice. So if they can't find a unicorn, they're perfectly willing to take a dog, a cat, a goat, or anything else they can to get their hands on. Well, Steve, um, the author says these are moral books, and I want to play some sound from when she was on the Today Show yesterday, if we can roll that. Do we have that? I made a very conscious decision that right at the beginning that I was writing about someone evil, and I wasn't going to tell a lie. I wasn't going to pretend that an evil person is a cardboard cutout and no one really gets hurt. Okay, if you're writing about evil, I think you, you genuinely you have a responsibility to show what that means. And that's why I'm writing them the way I'm writing them. I think they're quite, well, actually, I think they're very moral books. Steve Mounts, uh, there seems to be some merit in what she just said. How can you argue with that? I think the merit in what she said was they are evil books. Um, I think parents can make a decision on whether they want their children to read these books. She was, by the way, responding to a quote that my wife had given before the school board about the books being violent, and I applaud her for saying they were violent. Um, so apparently there's no disagreement on that. Jennifer James, you are a children's book buyer at the bookstore. Are you finding this to be a real phenomenon at your store, these books? Yes, we've never seen anything like it. It's unbelievable, and we're all very happy. Right. Well, what makes you happiest about it? Is it the sales, or is it the fact that kids are really loving to read now? The children run into the store, want to buy the book, and sit down and start reading it before they leave the store. Mm. Robert McGee is the author of The Search for Significance and founder of the Rafa Treatment Centers. There are those who defend the Harry Potter books by saying they're just fantasy. And so when people object to these books, they're made to look like fools because the people say, how can you object to these books? They're just fantasy. But that line of reasoning would tell you that you could include in fantasy any violence, pornography, whatever you wanted, and still defend those books by that very same statement. As an expert in world religions, noted cult and occult researcher Carol Matriciana has authored the best-selling books, Gods of the New Age and The Evolution Conspiracy, and has written and produced numerous videos for Jeremiah Films. Many argue that Harry Potter is just merely children's fantasy, and therefore it's harmless. The lie about this is that witchcraft is reality. J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter series, has gone through an awful lot of research. She is very accurate, otherwise we would have witches all over the country and the world saying this is not a true representation of our religion. This is a true representation of witchcraft and the black arts and black magic. And yet we have people that say this is merely fantasy and harmless reading for our children. Actually, what makes this more dangerous is that it is couched in fantasy language and children's literature and made to be humorous and beautifully written and extremely provocative reading. 
and it just opens up children to want to have the next one. This is what is so harmful. Joanne Rowling majored in mythology in Exeter University in England. She has borrowed not only from pagan religions, Celtic religions, the religions of the Druids, witchcraft, Satanism, a lot of the spells, the incantations, the, the philosophy behind the mythology and the religions is being put into Harry Potter's books. Yes, Harry Potter may be fictional, but there is a lot of religious teaching in symbols that perhaps the reader doesn't always pick out. The actual word Potter, if you ask a pagan, a witch, any knowledgeable expert in the occult or hidden arts, the potter is the female goddess, the goddess of Babylon, who is considered the potter who created human beings from clay. And they believe that the patriarchal God of Christianity, the, the God of Israel, copied that in a very poor imitation because he cannot give birth. Now listen to how important that is to understand. The feminine-oriented cult of witchcraft sees the woman and her process of birth as fundamental in the new life, the transformation, the alchemy, the changing of the inner man to higher consciousness, which is what Harry Potter is all about. In fact, that's what the first book is called, The Sorcerer's Stone, the alchemy of being transformed and changed through the inner man to become a new creature, which is again an, a, an upside down reversal of what a Christian believes that when they come into understanding a relationship, a personal relationship with Christ, they are transformed and take on the mind of Christ. The concept of fertility-based cults, feminine-oriented cults such as witchcraft, is the concept that the new birth can take place inside through meditation. You have inner transformation, inner wisdom, inner knowledge. And all this is done through concentration, visualization, all through Harry's books. Hamani and others say, concentrate, Harry. If you concentrate hard enough, you can have what you want. One of the arguments is that Harry Potter's series does not actually teach witchcraft, that it is not teaching the concepts of Mother Goddess and her consort, the Horned God, which is essential to the fertility uh, cults or the fertility-oriented witchcraft religion. And yes, there are the concepts of Mother Goddess being taught because Harry's mother gave her life for Harry the sacrificial death that she gave through love is a symbolism of goddess worship. It's an inversion, if you will, of God the Father whose son gave his life in love for his people. Now, the concept of teaching mother goddess is very, very important. Harry's mother gave her life for Harry so that he should be saved and through this love sacrifice, Harry was protected from death. Now, this concept is brought up several times. In fact, it is so important in witchcraft and pagan thinking that Voldemort, Harry's arch enemy, takes a vial of blood from Harry in book number four in order to have the blood run through his own veins in order that he can be resurrected and have a body. That is how powerful the blood sacrifice is. Another scary aspect of black magic is shape changing. The concept of being able to become an animal, change into an animal. Harry's father appears to Harry in a shape change later on, even though he's dead, he appears as a stag the horned god. 
So here we have the concept that shape changing is very normal. It is horrible. And the Bible clearly, clearly says that we are made as human beings when God created us and we cannot become something else. You might perceive you're becoming something else, but it's supernatural deception. The evil Lord Baltimore also went to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry with Harry's parents. And we're not awfully sure what the reasons are, but for perhaps jealousy because Harry's parents represented practicing the white side or the good side of magic. Baltimore, at the birth of Harry, wanted to kill Harry and Harry's parents. But somehow in this horrible battle, some of Baltimore's powers came to Harry and Harry got a death curse, a bolt of lightning, on his forehead as a mark of the curse from Baltimore. Also another interesting thing happened. Harry also acquired a power that he was able to talk to snakes, which is the same gift that the evil Lord Baltimore has. There is a connection with the talking snakes, Baltimore always represented as a snake, and by the way, both of them, Harry and Baltimore, share the power of the phoenix tail in their wand. And the phoenix, again, is a symbol of resurrection. Witchcraft is a religion. It gets tax-exempt status. It has a military chaplain. And it is recognized as a religion, a practicing religion. It is the fastest growing religion in America, incidentally, as well. I regard myself as a natural witch. Um, I was uh, regarding myself as a witch since early childhood. Um, I was brought up in a very isolated part of the country uh, on the Welsh border, which has a long tradition of magic and uh, Welsh sorcerers. Since I have been practicing the craft, there has been a great revival there are probably now as many people practicing witchcraft as there are Christians. It's almost as if there's a kind of grassroots feeling back towards paganism. We live in a kind of post-Christian era almost and that people are moving towards a kind of neo-paganism I suppose. Witchcraft is the religion of the countryside. It's the religion of very old forms of knowledge. And paganism is a religion which is a very old form of knowledge too. But paganism covers more than witchcraft covers. Witchcraft is, if you like, a division of paganism. Well, witchcraft is basically a nature religion. We, uh, we worship the gods of the woods and the fields. Those who practice witchcraft choose to believe there is no Satan and therefore no evil spirits. Yet they report experiencing spiritual powers from which they receive their power. Refusing to label these powers evil, they choose to believe their origin is either from nature or natural from within, but neutral. When I was a child, I was very aware of nature spirits, those which are called diva or local gods. We learn as practicing witches to tap into forces of nature and to actually, if you like, send out a spell or an invocation um, in a very powerful way. The primary offer of witchcraft is power, a very seductive power. One day a young 18-year-old girl came to see me. Her life was almost ruined by her preoccupation with witchcraft, but she would not give that power up because it was the only power in her life that she could count on. Another young man came to see me and said, I know how powerful these forces are, and I look at the lives of Christians, and I think my power is more powerful than what they're experiencing. The one of the most disturbing things about the Harry Potter books is it teaches children that witchcraft is for children. It does this by allowing children to read about other children in a school setting, and watching these children learn how to use spells and all the other elements of witchcraft. It teaches these children that witchcraft is just not for adults, but that children can access this power and use this power also. If you say there is no real power in witchcraft, 
then you should have no problem with the Harry Potter books. But there are two problems with your line of reasoning. First of all, you're denying the experience of hundreds of thousands of people who have practiced witchcraft through the ages. Plus, you're saying that God's warning in the Bible about divination, sorcery, and all the elements of witchcraft is actually worthless. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, it states, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, God identifies witchcraft as a sin, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Despite God's warning, many youth, including Christian youth, don't see much harm in witchcraft. So they see their friends casting spells and being involved in all manner of witchcraft and do not understand the dangers. They do not know that they're opening doors in their life to spirits which will come in and create very compulsive behaviors. And this is why many in witchcraft are compulsively into drug usage and to sexual activity and all manner of conduct which is very destructive. And yet, why should they be concerned when they hear nothing from the adults that warn them of what's coming? When a child is captured by witchcraft, they rarely choose to get out until very much later in their life after they have lived a very miserable existence. The giant introduces Harry uh, to the paraphernalia of witchcraft that Harry is going to now use in his boarding school Hogwarts. And this is done in Diagnon Alley, which is a sort of spiritual occult supermarket, flea market if you will, a street filled with shops of cauldrons, owls, robes, uh, wands, all the paraphernalia that is used today by witches in their rituals and ceremonies and spells today. So the reader is vicariously introduced to the tools of the trade that form the basis of the religion of witchcraft. Many have argued that Joanne Rowling is not teaching the children witchcraft and uh, the books are not about witchcraft because the spells aren't legitimate spells and because J.K. Rowling just pulls out very, very funny Latin words and she obviously knows her Latin and she's very humorous with the way that she tosses out expelleramus which gets rid of a spell or any of the other numbers of spells that she puts in in Latin. Petrificus totalis. The principle is that if you learn certain words, you can have power. And the books, the Harry Potter series, are connected to websites that get you into arenas where there are experts at teaching you the spells, the legitimate spells. What the reader is being introduced into in Harry is that is, there is legitimacy in rituals and spells, which are a sort of another word, let's say, of repetitive prayers, as Jesus said in Matthew, that don't be like the Gentiles and the pagans that just repeat their prayers for what they want. Queen of heaven, queen of hell, hornet hunter of the night, lend your power unto our spell and work our will by magic right. This is what spells are, repetitive prayer, repetitive prayer, which sort of induces a self-hypnosis that gives you the idea that your inner potential power, your psychic abilities, can bring about what you are visualizing in your head. While love spells probably isn't the focus of Harry's books right at the moment, because he's 11, 12, 13, in book four there is a sort of beginning of a relationship that Harry is involved in, a sort of affectionate uh, opposite sex thing. But love spells are very, very, very important in witchcraft. 
In fact, because it is a fertility cult, the concept, the, the focus in on sex and cosmic union for power is one of the important aspects of witchcraft. So it is no wonder that many, many teenagers are being lured into witchcraft through, in a sense, the magic of love. They want the boy they want, or they want the girl they want, and so they get involved in spells. And the websites are also pushing the fact of teaching children love spells. As above, so below. Then, of course, Hollywood glamorizes the whole concept, and through this film, The Craft, you can see that here, where the girl wants to have her boy, she gets involved in this ceremony, very powerful ceremony, calling down the love spirits, and, of course, she gets the boy she wants, and he doesn't know what is happening and why he is being seduced, in a sense, through his spirit, how this happened, but there it is again, showing that spells work. I drink of my sisters and I ask to love myself more and to allow myself to be loved more by others, especially Chris Hooker. <laughs> I know, it's pathetic. It's definitely pathetic. Well, it's just that, you know, I can't stop thinking about you and I don't know why, but I think I love you. And I've never loved anyone before except well, maybe my mom and, and, well, this little puppy that I had when I was little. <laughs> I, I think you should go home, Chris. No, Sarah, wait, please, Sarah, please. Look, I don't know what's happening to me. I, I, I can't eat, I can't sleep. Uh, can I help you? No, nobody can help me. Then there's the concept of curses. Now, uh, of course, white witches, or those that purport to be on the white side of the occult or hidden knowledge will say that they don't use curses in a derogatory way. However, Harry symbolizes white magic, and Harry uses curses or his magic for vengeance. When his auntie says something horrid about his dead mummy and calls her a name that Harry doesn't like, he does magic on her and she blows up, she gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and that is very, very cruel magic. And that is a curse and the, the sort of extension of spells that Harry is learning. So the reader is learning that they can be involved in vengeance through curses and perhaps the curses in Harry Potter's books aren't legitimate curses, but once again, they can go to the websites to get legitimate curses. But the point is that here is a practice that God finds so distasteful because he says that vengeance is mine and we are not to retaliate and cause poison through curses to our enemies. Harry Potter isn't the only book that's going on and on teaching the readers that curses have power. Hollywood also is showing us that curses have power. There's this graphic uh, scene in the craft that shows that a girl has upset another girl, and so there's a little braiding in the scene here that she wants to put a curse on her through her hair falling out, and through the power of the curse and the rituals and whatever words are used, the hair falls out and this girl is screaming and writhing and so she doesn't know what's happened, and of course she has no idea of the curse, but what's being told to the viewer is that there is power in curses, there is power in magic. Many parents don't recognize the danger of witchcraft because they look at their experience and they didn't experience that when they were growing up. They relegate witchcraft to Africa or some foreign country. They don't know how pervasive it is today in the youth culture. I know a nine-year-old girl in a Christian school who said, I love Harry Potter. I've always wanted to be a witch. I want to have the same power he has. The daughter of a pastor wakes up at night dreaming of being able to use the same powers as Harry. She's grown up in the church. She even witnesses to people who are in Wicca, but does not recognize what she's dreaming about is to actually use demonic power. I had a young youth pastor tell me recently about a girl who came to be part of his youth group, but she was also part of Wicca. She began recruiting 
children out of his youth group. He wasn't aware that those in Wicca take great joy out of seducing Christian children into Wicca. But Christian children are usually easy prey, for they don't understand witchcraft or what to look out for. Why has God warned us of witchcraft? He knows the dangers. He knows the spirits behind witchcraft. He knows they're out to kill, destroy, and rob people of their life. He knows that those who use the power of witchcraft have opened themselves up to these powers to come into them and to control them. And when they open themselves up to these spirits, they find themselves doing obsessive compulsive things such as drugs and sex and alcohol and many other destructive and violent activities. It's interesting that on the one hand, they sought this power to have control, and in the end, they've lost control of themselves. One of the arguments is that Harry Potter's series does not actually teach witchcraft, that there's no celebration of seasons. That is not true. By not using the seasonal terms, the argument is that there's no celebration. The Harry Potter series celebrates Halloween, which is a seasonal festival. While it's been given a Christian name, it is still a seasonal festival. In fact, at Halloween time, there are deaths and murders in bloodshed, and Halloween is considered a very important time to have blood sacrifice. So here we see very terrifying elements of the dark side of seasonal worship in Harry Potter, lightened up, given a frivolity, uh, called the Christian holiday, so it covers for the seasonal holidays. I can't really say when I became interested in Wicca, because it's always been part of me, part of my roots. I love Halloween. I think I'm a very autumn person. We dress up the house with cobwebs and so on, and we cast a circle, and we have a smoky cauldron, and we all scry, which means cla do clairvoyance, into the smoke which comes out of the cauldron. And we open the gates of the underworld. And if any spirits want to come forward and speak, we listen to them. My first initiation, when I became first, first degree, was on Halloween and uh, I felt very, very much in tune with the God. Foundational to the philosophy of witchcraft is reincarnation. And it is very, very important to understand this because this is the concept of there not being the finality of death, that the soul, the spirit, comes back into a new body after it dies. And throughout Harry Potter's books, ghosts are called for, there are supernatural spirits that come back, there are paintings where people come out of the paintings along the corridors of Hogwarts. All of this gives the child the concept that there is no death, that it's perfectly normal interacting with spirits, with ghosts, with things that look half-human, half-animal, mythological figures that, like the unicorns and the creatures that Hagrid um, has in his class of uh, mythical creatures. All these things fire up the imagination of the young reader to think that when they get involved, that they're not fearful of it because it's part of Harry's world, it's part of Hogwarts, and so the element of fear is taken away. Those who say that Harry Potter's books do not teach witchcraft don't understand that one of the essentials of witchcraft is that there is no good or evil. There is no right or wrong. It is as you perceive it. So there's a sort of relativism that in your situation, if you do one thing, or in my situation, if I do a different thing, we're both doing the right thing, even if it's wrong. There are no absolutes. It's based on the concept of evolution, that everything is developing. And as we are taught the concept of evolution, which again is synonymous with reincarnation and things are developing, so we get that there is no absolute. There is no right, there is no wrong. In fact, throughout the books, Harry is rewarded when he deliberately lies or deliberately does something wrong 
instead of the teachers expelling him, which Harry thinks he's going to be expelled for something he did wrong, he is rewarded. So when he goes on to a broomstick, when his teacher tells him not to go on to the broomstick, and he does in defiance, he is rewarded for disobedience by being put onto the Quidditch team. It doesn't matter what this little boy does that's wrong, he's rewarded for it. In fact, Hermione wants so much to be the friend of Ron and Harry. Well, Hermione is a goody-goody two-shoes, and throughout the, the earlier parts of the books, she is considered by Ron and Harry to be somebody that they don't want to be with. However, she lies to protect them. And this lie changes them, and the reward is that she becomes one of the trio and the team. So this kind of shifting situational ethics, non-absolutism, relativism is so contrary to the biblical concept of God is a God of truth, a God of right, a God of justice, and here is the bottom line of witchcraft being taught through the Harry Potter books, and it is part of a religious philosophy. The lightning bolt is a mark of power from the god Thor, again the horned god, a god of power. And this lightning bolt was considered so important in occult mythology that Hitler used it on his uniforms, on the collar of his uniform, and it is half of the swastika, which is the other lightning bolt that goes across. You go to any feminine-oriented cult, ask a witch what the significance of the broom is. It's a phallic symbol, and it's very important in feminine-oriented cult worship. And the concept of being on a broom and riding is so that you can be moved into an astral projected state, into another dimension to be able to have deeper powers. Good afternoon, class. Welcome to your first flying lesson. Stick your right hand over the broom and say, up. The same with the pointed hat, which again is a phallic symbol in occult reasoning. So all these symbols that are there of the brooms, the, the pointed hat of the, of the witches, the unicorn, that is all part of witchcraft and occult symbology of the fertility cults. Divination is the concept of being able to divine or see into the future. Fortune telling, palm reading, tea leaf reading and teacups, uh, crystal ball gazing, all these things are taught through the teachers, the witches and wizards in Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, who are all accomplished occultists. Children are being vicariously taught the dark arts the uh, arts which witches today are learning, many pagans today are learning. Now there's a difference between divining, seeking knowledge for the present or future, and sorcery, which is the manipulation. It's not the discovering of the future, but it's the manipulation of things right now that can change or influence a current situation or a person. Now that is how I got into uh, the New Age, because I wanted to manipulate uh, through powers that I was told were in my inner potential, that I had psychic abilities if I could develop them. And this is what every reader is being told in Hogwarts school that Harry has and every student there has. They have psychic powers that they are learning to develop through the classes that they go to. And by the way, you can really see the difference in development in Harry when he's 11 years old in book one to getting to book two when he's 12, 13, and by 14, he is extremely competent. And as Harry is learning, and as the teacher explaining, so is the little reader of four to six, and if they're not reading, by the way, there are cassettes that Scholastic puts out, series of cassettes that children can hear these stories.
Many of the parents that I talked to said that there was absolutely no trouble with Harry in the sense of that they as children had read Alice in Wonderland or uh, Sleeping Beauty and even, even many Christians say that having read C.S. Lewis who also talks about witches, that these things, witchcraft has not influenced them today and they are not proponents of witchcraft. However, I think there is a real difference and distinction here because in Sleeping Beauty, the witches there didn't teach the child watching or the child reading how to be involved in the inner intricacies of sorcery, which is to manipulate powers so that the child can have what the child wants or what the child craves. So these people that, yes, they saw witchcraft, they saw that it was bad, as in C.S. Lewis, who clearly defines it within a biblical worldview. We knew they were evil, and we were not, in a sense, infatuated or fascinated by their philosophy. Some Christian personalities are saying that Harry Potter's magic is just purely mechanical magic. Now, I don't understand purely mechanical magic because I don't know where in the Bible God differentiates between sorcery, that is, that manipulating what you want, and it being mechanical. Maybe adults can redefine mechanical magic to somehow justify the reading of these books, but tell me, a little reader, a young reader who is reading Harry Potter, that is becoming more and more fascinated with the powers of spells and curses and rituals and herbs and crystal reading and all the things that are going on and being taught at Hogwarts. How is that child to differentiate between real magic and mechanical magic, real spells and mechanical spells? I mean, a child doesn't care. The child just wants the power to be able to do what the child is doing. And Harry doesn't, doesn't care whether it's mechanical. It works for Harry. He puts his wand out and gives the spell and it works. It accomplishes what Harry is trying to accomplish. And that's the point. The children are seeing that their hero is getting what he wants with words, with prayers, with, with rituals. Therefore, he can do it. My deepest concerns and fears about Harry Potter is the teaching of the dark arts, the blackest of magic, that quite frankly, I didn't even get into in all my years of New Age because I was so scared of it. And yet here, it is graphically explained to young children how to be able to fight the dark arts, to defend yourself against the dark arts through an actual class called the Defense Against the Dark Arts by a black occultist. And in each of the books, the dark teacher changes because in, you know, in one case he, he's killed and because he's possessed by Baltimore the snake. So that just to let you know if you're possessed by a snake and the snake leaves you, you are dead meat. And that is the blackest side of occultism there is. And that is the teacher that is teaching Defense Against the Dark Arts. So here are the children and the readers, the Harry Potter and all his teammates in the schools, and the children that are reading the Harry Potter books being introduced to the darkest and black hearts that even disciples of witchcraft would, would be fearful of getting involved in. And then they're told that through their imagination, through stronger concentration, through stronger self-hypnosis, through their own power, power within themselves, which is being taught by the witches and wizards, they can defend themselves against the dark arts. And there are several very scary situations where the bog arts, as they're called, these horrible things that children fear. And you're told to think of anything that you fear, conjure it up, bring it to yourself, and then be able to fight it. This is a very, very scary thing to teach children. There's a possibility if you don't cast a circle, um, the forces that could come into the room could take over uh, in, a, in a form of possession. Um, we had one, one example here um, where one young woman, a nurse, was um, possessed by, I don't know what it was, but a, a horrible voice came through her and she passed out. 
Hail to the guardians of the watchtowers of the East. The powers of air and invention. Hear me! Us. Hear us. Hail to the guardians of the watchtowers of the South. Powers of fire and feeling. Hear us! Hail to the guardians of the watchtowers of the West. Powers of water and intuition. Hear us! Hail to the guardians of the watchtowers of the North by the powers of Mother and Earth. Hear us. Aid us in our magical working on this May's Eve. Serpent of old, ruler of deep, guardian of the bitter sea. Show us your glory. Show us your power. We pray of thee. We pray of thee. We invoke thee. what we, we call contacts, There's, there are other names for them. They are beings, that's the easy thing to call them, which can be, can be people who have lived on the earth or they can be God forms. They become almost as real as the people standing next to you. And whoever else you call doesn't actually materialize. You can't see them in, in the physical sense, but mentally you know that they are there. You can see them in your mind's eye. I have uh, on occasion touched upon, I suppose you could call them spirit guides. Um, people describe them in different way. I am aware of a hierarchy of spiritual advisors who live on another plane of consciousness that you can approach that will acknowledge you and advise you and assist you. I can feel him running through my veins. He's still in me. And we know that there's such a thing as possession because Baltimore possesses the Defense Against the Arts teacher in the book where he's sucking the unicorn. We know that he possesses the little 11-year-old girl through her writings in a journal where her feelings, her emotions, her thoughts that she is writing in the diary of the young Baltimore is giving him power to rise up. And he possesses this girl and he mocks and laughs at Harry later on in the book when he says she didn't even know that she was killing on Halloween when she had blood all over and she'd write in the diary, I don't know what came into me. I think I'm going mad because I'm doing things that I have no control over. So here she was, a little 11-year-old girl in Harry Potter's book, possessed by Baltimore's spirit, murdering on Halloween. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with Harry Potter. As the largest publisher of children's books in the world, Scholastic Inc., the U.S. publisher of the Harry Potter series, supplies nearly every public school in America with its products, thereby reaching more than 32 million children each year. In the last two decades, Scholastic has been producing more and more materials featuring witchcraft, graphic horror, supernaturalism, and spiritism. Scholastic eagerly secured the publishing rights to Harry Potter, which far surpassed the popularity of its predecessor, the occultic theme shock fiction book and video series, Goosebumps. As a supplier of teaching materials to American schools for over 80 years, Scholastic used its unrivaled position in the educational system to flood classrooms and libraries with Harry Potter books. 
recommending that teachers read them aloud in class. Scholastic's 35 school-based magazines, published for grades K through 12, tirelessly markets the Potter books to students while its award-winning website helps integrate Harry Potter materials into classroom activities. Scholastic pride themselves in supporting educators by networking resources through their revolutionary online curriculum systems. While the reading of Bible-based material is banned in American schools, the religion of witchcraft, repackaged through Harry Potter, is given honorable status and a strategic position. So here we have this religion introduced into the public school system through the Harry Potter books, through Scholastic Inc., the publishers, who supplies this literature to schools. And by the way, there are lots of teaching guides. For instance, there's Elizabeth Schaefer has written a Beecham's Handbook on how to um, understand Harry and goes into the symbolism of Harry, the mythology of Harry, which is all based on real mythology. And in Elizabeth Schaefer's book, she encourages the student to go to actual Wiccan, the, the websites of the Celts, Druids, uh, Pagans, Witches, the Witch Voice. These websites are being give, given credibility through the public school system. She also went into undermining the Bible, choosing Christian mystics that did not find the Bible the infallible word of God and her arguments were anti-Christian and anti-biblical. Now, when I tapped into some of the web pages that Elizabeth Schaefer recommended we go to, and from her site, where she introduces, for instance, going to the, the Witch's Voice, as I started going into these sites, I actually got email back thanking me for being interested in witchcraft and introducing me to basic 101s in witchcraft by practicing witches from the Witch's Voice, a website that is used by witches today. The, the bridges were so clearly seen by me that, okay, the, the child is introduced to what is called fantasy literature in the school system supported by taxpayer money. It is a religion being taught through Harry Potter and the reading materials and tools that are supporting further in-depth discovery are taking you to websites that are further fascinating you with a Wiccan philosophical worldview. We have an indoctrination program that is enticing us to further darker knowledge that now any child, any computer literate child can just follow the web pages and visit wherever they want and have glamorous versions of lessons in witchcraft and sorcery so that they can manipulate their teacher to give them good exam results, the person they love to like them, whatever it is that they are told will be possible through sorcery. J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter series, admitted that she got many, many requests for children that wanted to attend Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. And we know from books that are out there and interviews with children that they really wonder at night while they're laying awake if there is a Hogwarts that they can go to. If you go to the Warner Brothers site, they ask you to enlist into Hogwarts. Well, there are sites out there that are pulling in your children who are interested in learning more in various different schools of witchcraft and wizardry.
I want you to obtain this video and share it with your friends, your grandchildren, your children. And especially if your pastor has not seen this video, I'd like for you to share it with him. I know he'll want to share it with the congregation. And then there are those teachers, the school board members that need to see this film, also the politicians that govern you. There will be many, many questions that haven't been answered in this video and many questions that your friends or relatives or readers of Harry Potter would like answered. I would like you to visit this web page and email me with your questions and I will try and answer all your questions through email. One of the great advantages we have today is email. There's a link on this website which will teach you how to use email to inform as many people as possible about the